Welcome back students. So we have looked at uh, the structure of your manuscript and then some keys for writing uh, more clearly and organizing your manuscript. Uh, chapters 2 and 3 in your APA uh, book. We're going to highlight now chapter 4. And so we can see on this uh, our menu page that chapter 4 deals with the mechanics of style. So what do we mean by that? So we can click on the chapter and see that this chapter deals with general rules for clear, consistent presentation of scholarly work. We will discuss the basic tools such as punctuation, spelling, capitalization, italics, abbreviations, and numbers. So the mechanics of style here, we're really talking grammar rules. So let's uh, jump right in. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of different things here in a minute. Okay. Uh, so, spacing and punctuation. Space once after all punctuation as follows. After commas, colons, and semicolons. After periods that separate parts of a reference citation. After the periods of the initials in personal names. Okay. Use two spaces after the end of punctuation of a sentence. So basically, you're going to use one space after everything except the end of a sentence, and at that point, it will be two spaces. Okay? So let's move on. Now we're going to get into uh, most of the stuff you, you've heard of, but we'll see some things that maybe uh, are a little bit unfamiliar to you. First of all, let's talk about commas. Okay? Uh, the biggest issue with commas is the very first thing here between elements including before the word and and or in a series of three or more items. The height, width, or depth in a study by Stacy, Newcomb, and Bentler. Notice the comma is before the and and before the or. You have to put that in according to APA. And then also to set off a non-essential or non-restrictive clause, switch A, which was on a panel, Control the recording device. Non-essential clause starts with which. Uh, in the previous presentation, we said chances are if your clause starts with which, you're going to use a comma to set, set it off. Uh, if you are talking something specific, you will say that. Uh, switch A, that is on the green panel. Uh, control the recording device. Uh, in that sense, uh, switch A is on different panels, and we're wanting the one in the green panel. Uh, more used with commas to set off two independent clauses separated by a coordinating conjunction. Okay, so you have two independent clauses here. Cedar shavings covered the floor, period. The walls were covered with sod, period. Since we're using a coordinating conjunction and, to join these two sentences, we're going to set the two clauses off with a comma. Cedar shavings covered the floor, comma, and the walls were covered with sod. Okay? That's when you put a comma before an and in the middle of a sentence like that. To set off the a year in an exact date, August the 25th, 2005, was the correct date. Uh, notice we put a comma after August 25th and after 2005. Okay, so it's an exact date. To set off a year in a parenthetical reference citation. Jones, comma, 2001. And then here is one that is quite often missed. And that is to separate groups of three digits in most numbers of 1,000 or more. You will do this if you have numbers greater uh, than 999 for our class. So some good things about commas. Uh, pretty straightforward. Everybody pretty much understands commas. Let's move to semicolon. A little bit less understood. Semicolons are used to separate two independent clauses that are not joined by a conjunction. So here we say the participants in the first study were paid those in the second were unpaid. So we have two independent clauses. Uh, the participants in the first study were paid, period. 
those in the second were unpaid, period. They could be independent. We're going to join them together without the use of a conjunction. If we had a conjunction in there such as and, we would have said comma and those in the second. That was in the previous slide. The other main use of a semicolon then, uh, in addition to uh, two independent clauses not joined by a conjunction, is separating uh, series uh, elements in a series that already contain a comma within them. We don't see this very often, but we do see it. Okay, so for example, the color order of the boxes was red, comma, yellow, comma, blue, semicolon, blue, comma, yellow, comma, red, semicolon, yellow, comma, blue, comma, red. That tells the reader uh, that the boxes were in three separate orders. Okay, and it tells us what those orders were uh, each time. So you can see how that works here uh, using uh, the semicolon to separate uh, lists that already have commas within them. Um, and now probably the, the, the lesser known use is the colon. Okay. So we use a colon, and I'm going to give you some examples here, a bunch of different uses of colon, but here's the, probably the main thing that we would use it in a sentence. Between a grammatically complete introductory clause, one that could stand as a sentence by itself, and a final phrase or clause that illustrates, extends, or amplifies the preceding thought. If the clause following the colon is a complete sentence, it begins with a capital letter. Okay? And that's probably the, the least uh, used rule that I see as far as punctuation goes and have to correct. So, for example, comma, Freud wrote two urges, an urge toward union with others and an egoistic urge toward happiness. So notice that uh, the, the first clause here is our introductory clause, and this could be a complete sentence. For example, Freud wrote, to, wrote of two urges, period. That could be a complete sentence. The second clause, uh, an urge toward union with others and an egoistic urge toward happiness, is not a complete sentence, but it explains what those two urges are that we talked about in that introductory clause. Therefore, we use a colon here. Um, that one's pretty, pretty good as far as people getting that. Um, so the second one, though, notice this. They have agreed on the outcome. Informed participants perform better than do uninformed participants. So here you have two complete uh, sentences. They have agreed on the outcome, period. Informed participants perform better than do uninformed participants, period. Um, but because that second sentence is an extension or an amplification of the first. We can actually join them with a colon. But notice what we do is we just single space after the colon, and then we capitalize the first letter of that second clause. Not used as much, and when it is used, it's usually used incorrectly. Okay. Uh, so it all depends on the clause that comes after the colon. Uh, whether it is a complete sentence or not. If it's a complete sentence by itself, then you need to capitalize it. Otherwise, it's a small letter. So just a few other things. Colons are used in ratios and proportions, 7 to 1. In references between city and publisher, New York colon space, Wiley. Uh, and that's it for colons. Okay, now. Double or single quotation marks. Pretty straightforward again here. Um, I want to show you the thing with quotation marks that we'll usually see if you get wrong. Uh, use double quotation marks to enclose quotations in the text. The only time you use single quotation marks are if you're quoting something within a quote. Okay. So for example, Yale 1993 found that the placebo effect which has been verified in previous studies, disappeared when only the first group's behaviors were studied in this manner. That's a misspelling. 
so a few things here I want to point out. So first of all, placebo effect is something that Miel quoted from his source. And so what we're doing here is we're quoting Miel from page 276. Uh, but his source had already quoted the placebo effect. So we take that out uh, of the double quotations that Miel used and we put it in single quotations within the larger text of what he uh, said here. So it's a quote within a quote. The other thing is notice where our quotation marks end. The double quotation marks end at the end of the quote, but when you give a direct quote, you have to give a page number according to APA. The page number and the period go outside the end of the quotation marks. And that's what we see right here. And this is a very common error, uh, figuring out where to put the period and the page number and all the quotation marks. So you just uh, quote the direct quote, your page number goes after it, and then the period ends everything. So it makes sense. They're not going to quote their own page number, so that would not be inside the quote. And then the period at the end just makes the whole package complete. It's the bow around the package. Uh, a little bit more in block quotations. Most people don't know what block quotations are. Any quotation of 40 or more words. You do not use quotation marks to enclose block quotations. You do use double quotation marks to enclose any quoted material within a block quotation. It's just the opposite of what we said. So since you're not using double quotation marks around uh, the block quotation, uh, if you're quoting something inside of it, you do use the double quotation marks. And it's a little bit different as far as the uh, page number uh, because you have to cite a double quotation or a block quotation just like normal. So please check your APA manual on where to put that. The use of brackets. Uh, we saw brackets in an example earlier. Here's another example. When his own and others' behaviors were studied, uh, Hanish 1992, page 24. So we quote Hanish 1992 as our source, or that's our, that's our citation. We include the page number because we have a direct quote. But when, what we want to do here with the brackets is identify exactly whose behaviors were studied. And so we put his own and others inside the brackets. That did not appear in the original quote, but we want to give that kind of information. And so that's why we put it uh, in there. So the reader will understand uh, whose behaviors it is we're talking about. That's the use of brackets, okay? So capitalization, for the most part, straightforward. A couple of things that people generally miss, though, on capitalization. Uh, we know words beginning in a sentence. If the name of the author begins with a lowercase letter, it should be capitalized. So Duvall, 1994, concluded the following. The DE or the, the D in Duvall is normally used as a small letter or written with a small D. But since it begins the sentence, we have to capitalize it. Okay? And then what we talked about earlier, the first word after a colon that begins a complete sentence. The author made one point. No explanation that has been suggested so far answers all questions. So those are two complete sentences, but we're going to join them together with a colon. So we have a space after the colon, and because the second clause is an independent clause, we're going to begin it with capital letter. Okay? So those are, uh, everything else is pretty straightforward as far as capital letters. Now let me tell you what is not capitalized that I typically see. Things such as course subjects, uh, the, the teacher, for some reason, uh, students like to capitalize teacher and principal, those things are not capitalized. Uh, only thing in course subjects that are capitalized are proper nouns like English and Spanish. Okay, Otherwise, course subjects are not capitalized. Um, so moving on, uh, italics. So when do we use italics? We have a couple of slides here that deal with the use of italics. 
So I'm just going to go through the list here. Titles, periodicals, and microfilm publications. Some of you don't even know what microfilm are, but uh, trust me, it's, it's a thing that is out there. So The Elements of Style by Strunk and White was a book that I used dealing with uh, grammar. It has now obviously since been replaced with APA. We don't usually refer to uh, Strunk and White much anymore. But The Elements of Style is the name of a book. So that's the title. Uh, you're not going to deal with any science probably, but genera, species, and varieties are uh, italicized. Introduction of a new technical or key term or label. So the term backward masking. So because we're introducing this term as a brand new term, we're going to put it in italics. Okay. The box labeled empty. So here we're, we're uh, it's a key term defining the box. Okay. Which one we want specifically. Uh, and then finally on this slide, letter, word, or phrase cited as a linguistic example. So for example, words such as big and little. Typically what we see are those put in quotation marks, and that's an error they need to be put in italics. Or the letter A. Again, typically that's put in quotation marks by error. It should be put in italics. Uh, another list uh, for using italics, not so much anymore here, but uh, words that could be misread. Okay, so here we say the small group, uh, meaning a designation, not a group size. So we're not saying the small uh, group, we're talking about the type of group, okay, the group designation. Uh, if it were the size of the group, um, then it would be redundant. Okay. Uh, letter used as a, a statistical symbol or algebraic variables. We, we, you're not going to deal with this, uh, most likely, um, but the key test or trial in, um, those would be in italics. Some test scores and scales, uh, MMPI scales such as HS or PD. Periodic, uh, periodical volume numbers in the reference lists. Uh, this you will use, and we will look at this at the uh, last uh, presentation dealing with references and citations. And then finally, anchors of the scale. You, you probably won't use this, but you may come across it. And anchors mean when we say, uh, for example, a scale ranging from 1 to 5, where 1 is poor and 5 is excellent. Poor and excellent are anchors in our scale. So we can put those in italics and say health. Ratings range from one poor to five excellent, and those anchors are put in italics when it's written out. Abbreviations. Uh, the issue with abbreviations is pretty simple. Uh, the most common problem I see is uh, the use of acronyms. So um, the term to be abbreviated must, on its first appearance, be written completely and followed immediately by its abbreviation in parentheses. Use the abbreviation in text thereafter without further explanation. In other words, do not switch between the abbreviated and written out forms of a term. And that's uh, a common error. Both of those errors are common. In other words, uh, so let's look at some examples. My last visit to Wake County Public School System. WCPSS occurred in April. I plan to visit WCPSS soon to follow up on our discussion. Another example, English learners, parentheses, ELs, parentheses, will have difficulty adjusting at time. It is best to pair ELs with strong academic performance. So the two problems then are that uh, in the first example, uh, when students do just the opposite. They say, my last visit to uh, WCPSS and put Wake County Public School System in parentheses. That's a problem. That's, that's wrong. You spell out the name first, the acronym in parentheses. The other problem is that students will sometimes go back and forth between the acronym and the full name. 
once you put it in parentheses and introduce the acronym, you need to use the acronym for the rest of your paper. Okay. So those are the two things dealing with abbreviations. When it comes to numbers, a couple of things about numbers. Uh, in APA, this is something that most people, if, if they're going to mess up with numbers, it's usually right here. Numbers 10 and above are expressed as numerals. 0 to 9, you spell. Unless, unless, and here's the unless. Most of the time, though, you're going to uh, use numerals, Arabic numerals, 10 and above. Numbers that immediately precede a unit of measurement. So if we set a 5 milligram dose, a 10.54 centimeter of blank, those numbers we're putting in Arabic numerals no matter what. Or numbers that represent statistical or mathematical functions, fractional or decimal quantities, percentages, ratios, and the percentiles or quartiles. And some of this you may use. Okay. So multiplied by 5, we use the Arabic numeral, 3 times as many, 0.33 of the blank, more than 5% of the sample, and we're going to talk about using percent versus the term percentage, a ration of 16 to 1, and finally the fifth percentile. So in talking about the, using the percent symbol versus spelling out the word percent, in your book, APA book, Section 4.45 says use the symbol percent when it is preceded by a numeral. Use the word percentage when a number is not given. So, for example, found that 18% of the rats determined the percentage of rats. Okay, so you can see we use percentage because there is no uh, number given. If there were a number, we would use the percent sign. Uh, a little bit more with numbers. Last slide on this page or on this section. Uh, use words to express any number that begins a sentence. So we said that uh, numbers 10 and above are typically written in Arabic numerals unless they begin the sentence. And then we have to spell them out. We don't begin sentences with numbers. So for example, 12 students increased and 12 students decrease. The rule is that uh, you want to try to avoid beginning sentences with numbers. But if you have to, you need to spell them out. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that I see involving numbers in the beginning of sentences are years. So when you begin the sentence with uh, 1995, you need to spell out 1995. You don't write 1995. Okay, we don't begin sentences with Arabic numerals. The other thing is that we're going to use words to express common fractions. One fifth of the class or two thirds majority. Those are common fractions and so therefore we use numbers. Uh, to form plurals of numbers, and this is a common, common mistake when it comes to numbers. Whether expressed as figures or as words, we add an S or an ES alone without the apostrophe. In APA, we do not use an apostrophe S. So fours, four becomes fours, sixes, or six becomes sixes, 1950 becomes the 1950s with just an S, and 10 and 20 become tens and twenties with just the S. Okay, so there are no apostrophe S's when we're making plurals. An apostrophe shows possession. And we're not showing possession, we're making plurals. It makes perfect sense when you think about it. Okay, so that is it for uh, some grammar stuff. In the next presentation, we're going to skip chapter five and we're going to move up to uh, crediting our sources and how do we uh, avoid plagiarism and credit our sources accurately. And that will be on the next presentation.